Hi, this is Roger Moore, and you're listening to James Bond Radio. Hello, and welcome to episode number 143 of James Bond Radio. And we only have a very, very special celebrity guest that we're both very, very excited about. It's only BB Dahl herself, Lynn Holly Johnson. My name's Tom Sears, and I'm joined by my good buddy Chris Wright. How you doing, Chris? Hello, 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 everyone. Hello, hello. How, my name's how Chris. excited are you today? I am unbelievably excited, man. Do you know what? I've even stocked up on ice cream ready for this show. Oh, man. I've got yeah. like a big tub of Hagen dazs ready to go. I'm going to spoon feed it to Lynn Holly. I'm sure she won't mind. Um, yeah, no, mate, I'm, I'm so so excited when when we found out that Lynn wanted to be on the show I was like uber excited mm. like she she's just so nice as well lovely yeah. obviously we'll get to see that in a moment and I don't hopefully she doesn't mind me saying but also rather rather attractive still Tommy well, I, you know I, it, I, I listen, certainly think she's I, looking rather tasty absolutely I, I've got to say I, I, I got a little <laughs> bit shy during the interview but I, I, what I must be said is that for your eyes only, for me, was like, it, GoldenEye was my formative one when I hit my teenage years. But in my pre-teenage years, I was all about For Your Eyes Only. I watched yeah. that film so much when I was a kid, like 10 years old, I would say, around that kind of time. I knew it inside out so to, to such a degree that I had to not watch it for a long time just so I could sort of like reset it a little bit and watch it again as an adult. Yeah. And BB was a bit of a special one for me, Chris, because BB, as for me as a 10-year-old lad, BB was... She, yeah. she, you know, the Bond girls previously they all they're all like women. Do you know what I mean? And as a ten year old boy, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, you know that that's too much for me. Too old. Yeah, Whereas yeah, BB yeah, yeah. was like she almost felt like the the achievable one that I could you know yeah. potentially <laughs> pull if I was you know in BB's you know that that was an important thing for me as a as a young boy when I'm just learning wow. the ropes of life. Yeah. You know? right. um, so yeah. So, it, so it, I take it you told this to Lynn, yeah. I I well I sort of mentioned it a little bit, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, but yeah, so it's an exciting one, and yeah, what. What a lovely, lovely person. So nice of her to do, uh, to spend some time and uh, talk Bond with us and many other things as well. So it's we're in for a special one today. And as well, nice. like a lot of the time, when you're interviewing people, there's uh, some you just never know what you're going to get. Sometimes it's like, no. oh, you know, I can spare you half an hour, and you're on, the, and it's very much that. And it's like, okay, got to go. All right, cool, yeah. off you go. Whereas with Lynn, I feel like you know, we were chatting for a good hour and a half, and I feel like yeah. if we'd have had more questions or, yeah. or whatever, she just sat there and chatted to us all oh, afternoon, completely. which was so lovely. It was really lovely, yeah. and uh, yeah, so it's 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 a it's a special one for everybody today. I think I think we're all going to fall in love with Lynn Holly Johnson a little yeah. bit more than we already Again. did. I think, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely, man. Oh, I can't wait. Okay, so before we go and uh, have a little chat to to Lynn, should we do listener trivia, or do you want to do a bit of the spiel first? Oh, let's let's do some re- listener trivia. Who have we got this week? Okay, so the new listener trivia question this week is from Mister Rory Simpson. Should we have a listen to Rory's question? Well, let's do it. Hi, Chris and Thomas. Rory from the UK with a trivia question for you. Simple question. Hope it hasn't been asked already. How many actors and actresses who have appeared in Bond films have won acting Oscars? So they could have won the Oscar either before or after appearing in a Bond film. But how many actors and actresses that have appeared in Bond films have won Academy Awards for acting? So that could be Best Actor, Actress, Supporting Actor, Actress. Good luck. Mm. Oh, that is a good question. There go. there's, there's one that immediately springs to mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, you know, a, there's a couple. In fact, there's yeah. a few. In fact, All right. how, yeah. how many did he say there were? Did he give a number? Or I not? He didn't give a number there. No, no. it was just okay. just how many. But uh, yeah. yeah, all right. That's uh, that's a cool. good question. Nice one, Rory. Nice one, Rory. <laughs> nice one for phoning in. So before we get cracking and talk to Lynn, then come and join us on the social medias. You got Facebook, you got Twitter, you got Instagram. Just search for James Bond Radio on those, or James Bond Podcast on Instagram. That's a little bit different over there. Uh, come to jamesbondradio.com. You can uh, see all the podcasts there. Loads of articles and stuff as managed by our chief of staff Mr Jack Lugo um, you can also leave us a voicemail over on the website as well so if you haven't done that yet I'm going to I'm going to throw the call out to all the listeners who haven't sent in a quote or a trivia question or a message of some kind in the past let's get some fresh voices on the show so if, if that's Definitely. you you're listening and you think oh hold on I haven't done that yet go on son get stuck in get involved send us a message whether it's a quote trivia question whatever it is get involved and of course as chris has just pointed out over the webcam there leave two messages so if you've got a question 
Call us once with the question, leave us a separate message with the answer. And uh, that's useful for us in terms of editing it into the show. So that's lovely. All right, cool. I think that's covered it, hasn't it, Chris? There's also iTunes. Come and subscribe on iTunes uh, and leave us a lovely glowing five-star review if you feel we deserve it because that helps us rank higher in the searches and attract more listeners. Even if you don't listen on iTunes, do it anyway because it helps us out. Bit of a laugh, isn't it? Why not? (laughs) Why not? So without pressing any further, shall we have a chat with the absolutely lovely Lynn Holly Johnson, BB Dahl herself? Uh, Actually, quick question before we go to it. How long did it take you to get the name BB Dahl? A long time, actually. I'd never yeah. picked up on that when I was a kid. When yeah. I was young, I didn't either. Like yeah. baby doll, BB doll. You just yeah. it was just BB, and and I didn't quite get it. I just I doll. I always considered for roll doll, um, yeah. and that's where I was thinking of that. You know. Um, so yeah, I never really. It's one of those things where how did I not get that when I was young? But obviously, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a bit later Absolutely. we got it, didn't we? <laughs> but yeah cool. Uh, yeah, cool, cool little name though. You know, a little bit more subtle than some of them, but, but still a really cool name. Absolutely yeah. good stuff. All Suits right. the character as well. I'm getting. I'm getting a little bit nervous, Chris. I'm getting a little bit oh, nervous. Know. All right, Me cool. Too. Let's uh, <laughs> let's chat to BB Dahl herself, Miss Lynn Holly Johnson. Who are you? My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James. Bond. What do you think you're doing? So today I'd like to welcome our special guest to James Bond Radio. It's Lynn Holly Johnson. Hi, Lynn. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Nice to see you guys on a Saturday afternoon, huh? Saturday evening? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I've got to be honest, I, if I go a little bit quiet and shy, you'll have to forgive me because For Your Eyes <laughs> Only was the Bond movie I watched more than any other when I was a kid of about seven or eight years old. So to have BB live in front of me on my computer screen is a bit of a moment for me. So so apologies if I go all quiet and bashful. <laughs> uh, that's, that is great to hear. Thank you. Thank Actually, you so it, it, it might, that might be two of us, so it might just be you in the interview. I hope that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So what we'll do then is we'll kick straight off with our 007 quickfire questions. And then uh, uh-uh. then we've got some more questions for you afterwards. So we're going to jump straight in with question number one, which is, Lynn Holly Johnson, what is your favourite James Bond film? Well, <laughs> can I say For Your Eyes Only? Of course. No, probably um, For Your Eyes Only and then Live and Let Die. Oh, nice. nice one. What is it about? Uh, obviously, Live and Let Die is a perfect choice, but what is it about Live and Let Die then that kind of uh, grabs your attention? Well, the music. Well, you know, I think the music in all the movies is it's so catching and, and you know, we play the soundtrack from all of them and um, when we have parties here. So, oh, really? Yes. Oh, that's fantastic yeah. to hear. But really, for yeah. your eyes only, you know, I get a lot of neat compliments on that movie so it's pretty special it's a good one yeah yeah it certainly is i like it in terms of it's rogers one where he goes that little bit darker and a little bit grittier and i think everyone really appreciates that and and it definitely sort of uh, yes yeah Yeah. holy cow it's uh it's way darker and grittier now oh it certainly is you couldn't i don't think roger could have done the sort of movies that they're they're bashing out these days yeah. But, uh, yeah. Okay. So on to question two, then, Lynn. Have do you have you read any of the James Bond books? And if so, do you have a favourite? No, I've not read any of them. Um, I've read a little bit about Ian Fleming's life, and he's a pretty fascinating man. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Was that like a, bi- a biography of his? Yeah. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, question number three, then. I think I might know the answer to this one. Who is your favourite actor to have played James Bond? Well, you guys, I have to say Roger Moore. (laughs) That's okay. I'm in agreement. He's my favorite too. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, He's fantastic. He's fantastic. Okay. So this one then, question four, might be a bit uh, bit easier. It is (laughs) – Who – too hard on the last one. <laughs> so aside from yourself, aside from sort of the character BB doll, which is your favorite Bond girl character in the series? Uh, well, 
my dear friend Gloria Hendricks. Oh, that's, that's ah, that's very nice. Yeah. We met her very She's recently. Just She's cool. A barrel yeah. of fun, and she was perfect in that role. Um, yeah, you know, and and Maude Adams is a wonderful gal. Um, uh, I've spent so much time with um, a lot of the girls um, doing different events, and uh, it's a it's a pretty neat thing to have those relationships with those gals it's you know it's a it's a part of history and they've each had their little input over the years and um and we kind of stick together as kind of a team it's it's pretty cool that's really Uh, nice to hear actually isn't it yeah so do you feel every time you meet up is it like the old gang kind of getting back together even though you weren't on the same film but obviously you've you've met yes Yes. Um, uh, Lana is um, this wonderful gal. Um, Some of the other gals uh, uh, that I see once in a while, it's just kind of neat because we've worked on a movie where it is such a family. And even though we've we've all done other stuff, you know, but this this collection of people, the Broccoli family and. And, you know, all the different James Bonds, you know, <laughs> it's um, it's pretty cool to be a part of that family. It's quite a unique thing as well, isn't it, for a series that's been running this long? It's it's there's nothing else oh. really like it, is there? No, no, it's it's historic. I mean, if you if you look at the whole. The, the history of movie making, you know, when talkies started till mm. now. I mean, what are we, 55 years of James Bond movies, something like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, n- nothing else comes close to that. I mean, you might think Star Wars is, but that's probably about half as long. I mean, mm. James Bond is... Uh, it's been around forever. It should have been honored at the Oscars when they had the 50th anniversary. Now you're talking my language. Absolutely. <laughs> <Good stuff. laughs> okay. So next question then, if you can possibly think of like one scene in the whole series, is there one that kind of sticks out for you? Like a common one might be, you know, the golden girl on the bed from Goldfinger or something like that. Is there one particular scene that always kind of sticks out as the most memorable? Um. Ursula Andress. There it is. That's the answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> right there. Absolutely. I mean, that was such a beautiful scene that they had to do it again, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Completely. Yeah, I think yeah. So, so. Like, when would you have seen that? Do you, do you like remember like what your earliest memory of Bond was? Was that perhaps one of the earliest times you saw Bond on the screen? It, it, it probably. Yeah. Um, I didn't see it before I got this role. I probably saw two Bond movies, maybe, you know, because I was a pretty busy kid growing up Mm. um, with figure skating and acting and um, never really got around to going to movies. So, yeah, I can imagine. All right, cool. Interesting. And then final one of the quick fire questions then is of all the locations you worked on in For Your Eyes Only, uh, all those sets or, or any of the locations, which was your personal favorite? Well, working at Pinewood it was so special to me because it was the second movie I did there. I did a Disney movie with Betty Davis mm-hmm. at Pinewood. And so the next movie I got was For Your Eyes Only. And I just yeah. thought, wow, it's like Pinewood is my spot. It's yeah. my, you know, it's uh, I'm going home to Pinewood. It's um and, and so then, therefore, you know the people not working specifically on that movie, but you know what's happening around Pinewood. You know the the people in the restaurant, and so that's kind of special. Yeah. But yeah. Um, uh, in For Your Eyes Only, I really loved working in Crete. Nice. It was not me. It was not me. <laughs> it wasn't you. I was not in Crete. No. <laughs> That was, um, I remember clearly when Cubby said to me, 
Um, so this shot in Crete where you're supposed to walk across that hallway, mm -hmm. we're just going to have somebody else do it because it's a long shot. We'll never even know if it's you. So can you go to Toronto and work on choreography right now? We're going to go do this in Crete. So I'm not in Crete. No I'm way. I'm going to have to look back at that scene now and, and see if I can spot yeah. that. That's cool. Interesting. Yeah. I've learned something already. That's that's great. Cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Cool. So what was your start then in the in the film industry? Like you mentioned there that you were kind of you know, into figure skating and modeling and all that kind of stuff in your younger uh -huh. years. So what, what kind of first got you into all that stuff? Um, well, the very beginning is... Um, my my brother was baby of the month um, <laughs> in the newspaper in Chicago, and then my mom was pregnant with my sister, and then I came along, and she finally got around to answering this thing that my brother won, but he was already in kindergarten, so she took me on um, to go meet this um, agent, and immediately I started working, and I did about over 110 commercials. And, wow. Uh, lot of catalog work up until I was about 12, but I was also skating a lot at the time. Um, and then around 12 or 13, skating kind of took over because I was a competitor and I needed to put in more ice time. I skated, you know, two hours before school, four hours after school. And wow. um, then I, um, to continue my competitive career, I moved out to Southern California to train with one of the top coaches in the country. And so then I had an agent out here in California and uh, one thing led to another and they were looking for, Columbia Pictures was looking for an ice skater for this movie called Ice Castles and then I was working. <laughs> that was it. So there was never really any question. You were always going to be kind of in showbiz in some way or, or performing in some way from day one by the sense of things. Oh yeah, I loved it. I mean, I was doing plays as a little kid. It was my favorite thing. You know, I was, um, my mom would pick me up when it was recess, like lunch and recess. I was, you know, racing downtown for an audition and I, I, you know, it was fun. It was just, um, it was full of grins and laughter. And, um, I never, uh, you know, I never went through that Thing where you know I had you know this hard working childhood although I do tell my kids I worked hard my <laughs> whole childhood you get out there and work hard too well, there you, you go know? you got to do those things I guess with the, <laughs> exactly. with the next generation but uh, cool so that, you, you started off pretty strong didn't you because didn't you get a golden globe for ice castles yes nice. yes golden globe nomination um I um I I played um Helen Keller in a theater in Chicago and we got a Joseph Jefferson award and then ice castles got that. And, um, yeah, I was, I was darn tootin' lucky with this career. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, um, I was in, you know, acting classes when I moved out here and, um, I was always working and, um, I'm in an acting class working with wonderful actors who you know don't have an agent and have never worked not in the union and it was mm. like how, this business is crazy because you know everybody's working so hard and either you make it or you're not and it just started to kind of feel like a, a lottery mm. whether the career happens or not it's tough isn't it our business because you get a lot of people who are super talented but for whatever reason just things don't happen for them it's just kind of you just got to have that little magic thing that happens just at that right moment and oh, uh, it's yeah it sounds time. like you you had that from there from the go uh just lucky yeah yeah absolutely so you your next film after that was uh, the watcher in the woods is that right Yes. It was like a, a Disney horror film kind of thing, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. So what was that this, like? Well, this was right when Disney Studios was trying to um, change their image because Disney was not making money at the time. Wait, hold on a second. Am I losing battery? No, I'm good. Okay. okay. So Disney was not making money at the time. And they started with this movie called The Black Hole. And it was supposed to be scary and hi. 
<laughs> um, um, so the black hole was supposed to be scary and, and watch in the woods with Betty Davis and this is going to be scary and you know we went on tour to promote this movie to all colleges and um, this was Disney's goal of stepping out of that Disney image of course nowadays if you say Disney you know, everybody's you know highly it's highly praised to say it's a Disney movie but at the time um, in all of that promotion going around the country, I was not allowed to say the word Disney. I could only say release through Buena Vista Pictures. Interesting, That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And even, you know, the movie The Black Hole, that was, you were not supposed to say Disney. But, um, you know, it, it was, it, it's interesting that that Disney family, um, Ron Miller, who is, um, the wait a second uh, now I have my names mixed up. The brother-in-law, Walt Disney's Walt Disney's son-in-law, was one of the producers, and the other producer they kind of argued on what would be scary and what would not be. For instance, there was a scene with this um, the uh, the horse that I'm riding on gets spooked by this monster and the horse goes tearing down the field. Um, and, uh, it, it cuts away to a truck and you realize, okay, the truck and the horse, they're going to intersect. And so then you see, you know, then you see me galloping and it cuts back to the truck and then you see the truck make a swerve as he's on a bridge. But right before that, it cuts to the truck driver eating a berry pie, right? As he's driving before he sees this horse coming towards him. So then the shot of the truck tumbling off the bridge, right? Into this creek below. And the argument was, okay, if it's Disney, we have to show the truck driver that he's okay. And the other argument was, no, this is new Disney. This is Buena Vista Pictures. We have to assume, you know, the, that the truck driver's dead or mangled or whatever. And the Disney son-in-law won the argument. And so it, after you see me gallop away, then you, it's a shot of the truck driver coming up behind the wheel with Barry all over his face. <laughs> so, you know, then I'm, I'm at all these different colleges promoting this movie and it was kind of like, Disney, are you really being scary or what? I mean, showing the, you know, the truck driver with Barry all over his face, you kind of took away that power of being scary, but it was a, it was a tenuous time for that company. And um, it's interesting now, They've, they've made that move, mm. and the name Disney is so powerful. Absolutely. That's cool. That's crazy. So right after that, I believe, that was time for you to get involved with Bond, wasn't it? That was for your eyes only. And I think yes. Cubby yes. Broccoli had seen you in Ice Castles. Is that right? Is that where the link came from? Yes. Yes, because Ian Fleming did not write the character of B.B. Dow. Mm -hmm. So Cubby had seen me, and um, I guess he thought Roger – should have <laughs> some young gal and so i was that kid <laughs> nicely done so and michael wilson created the character so what was that audition process like what well, when did you first get the call for the audition and all that kind of stuff yeah i i did not think much of it because you know at the time coming from my athletic background being a competitor um, you know, you sort of take one step at a time. You're at one competition, right? Or you're at one audition, right? And I never really thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to meet Cubby Broccoli. It wasn't like that at all. It was just another audition and, you know, train hard, read the script. Or actually, there was no script for that. Um, um, and I went to Cubby's house and just into this, you know, one room in the house and we just had a conversation and um, it was unlike any other audition I've ever been on. Um, and so we chatted away and that was that and off I went. And, you know, at the time I was doing auditions. I mean, I had, you know, interviews that were just a long conversation with Steven Spielberg and uh, long conversations with Dustin Hoffman and what? Cubby what? Broccoli. And so it was just kind of, um, you know, whatever role comes up next, I'll work hard and train hard. And 
um, I never really realized that meeting Cubby and doing this movie was as big of a deal as it has become. I even while filming, I had no idea that you know, decades later, I'd still be talking about beating down. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's become much more moving year after year to, um, to, you know, come up with all of these cool memories that happened and, you know, and, you know, of course I was pretty young, so it's not like I was, um, agog at the, 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 the you know, impact of this whole James Bond thing at the time. I was, I was, uh, I was mentally younger than what I was chronologically. And that's, you know, <laughs> from being a competitive athlete. Absolutely. I know, I know Miriam Darbo has said in the past that once, once you're a Bond girl, that's it for life. Then it's it. You're in, yeah. there's no way of getting out of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which, which isn't a bad thing though. No. <laughs> right. That's Okay. Do you remember how long it was between after you went to see Cubby and when you got the definitely a OK, OK, you're in, this is it, you got the role? Um, yeah, I would say probably within a couple of weeks. And and again, it was not like, oh, my gosh, I, I'm doing a James Bond movie. It was like, OK, I'm going back to Pinewood, got the next job. Good, good. You know, yeah. it, it, I had no idea what this would mean. And also, because I said at the beginning of our interview, I, I had not seen a lot of James Bond movies. I was not really in tune with the film industry that much. I was either running, swimming, skating, or in acting class. And that was my small little world. Actually, Dan, so how, how did they do it in those days? Because like now with a big, you know, tentpole movie like a Bond or a Star Wars, all those scripts are kept under lock and key. Sometimes it's okay. just literally your scenes and all that kind of stuff. Like how did it work for you? Was it, you know, here's the script for the whole movie. Here's just your scenes. Was there any secrecy in those days around that? or was No, it- no. Yeah, here's the whole script. And, you know, the, the rewrites were so funny in those days because um, – uh, the first rewrite, you know, the script is all white pages, right? Yeah. The first rewrite, I think it would be blue pages. And then it would, the next rewrite on that blue pages would be pink pages. And then you get yellow pages. And by the end of shooting, your script would be pretty much multicolored. Now, really, nowadays, I'm sure it is totally different. And, you know, of course, they're, you know, the guys sitting there typing. I mean, it's like it's <laughs> where we are in the world, you know, you would never believe that this this movie that you and I are talking about, I mean, the guys in the office typing away, you know, you can picture a type. Do you guys know what a typewriter looks like? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, with, oh, typing with a piece of carbon behind it. it, it do people have scripts right now or is it just on your computer? Um, you still get scripts for read-throughs and stuff, but I think how they're initially written is is all done on computer these yeah. days, isn't it? Uh, but there is something about the old-fashioned noise of a typewriter, isn't there? And the whole ching and oh and, yeah, you know, it's uh, yeah. yeah. I think that'll always be in people's minds for sure. Right. So uh, you, your character is quite lucky in terms of when you were filming um, for your eyes only. You did quite a lot of location filming. Obviously, you were in the ski resort of Cortina, which looks amazing on the film. So what was that like filming uh, out in Cortina? It must have been a joy. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I mean, I, I had skied a lot um, beforehand, but that was a blast and a half. Um, you know, I, I did not have a whole lot of scenes in Cortina. So each day I was not working on the set. My sister and I were picked up by a very fine Italian <laughs> specimen man who would take the skiing and, you know, make sure my skiing was um, doing okay. So my sister and I were skiing with these nice men. And um, and then I was working and um, it, it was really fantastic you know skiing over there is totally different than resorts here in the states 
So something something I've always been uh, been curious about is how with like your skating scenes in the movie is like how choreographed with this, was that? Did they just like push you out there and say go and do your thing and make it up as you go along? Was there anybody kind of no, choreographing th- your yeah, move? There a, uh, yeah, there was a lot of choreography, but it ended up that um, we didn't do. I mean, there was choreography with music, and um, it ended up that we did not use so much of the choreographed scenes on the ice. Um, some of the stuff was cut back a little bit, but I worked with the same choreographer that I worked with, um, in ice castles. So that was fantastic. And so during the middle of filming, I went back to Toronto to work with him and I was skating, you know, at ungodly hours, um, in London, um, just to have private ice and, um, to work with choreographer. And that was, that was great fun, you know? Um, it must have been lovely having your sister out there. Was that was that part of the deal that your family went out with you when you were working and everything? Yes. Uh, um, they decided I needed to be, you know, I was not going to take my mom and I needed a companion. And so that has been so special for my sister and I. Oh, yeah. l- lucky sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a ball. An absolute ball. You know, also um, the skiing in Cortina, um, uh, Roger's um, stuntman, um, Wolfgang Younginger, mm. he was wonderful. So if I wasn't, you know, a gog over at the Italian ski instructor, it was Wolfie. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> just... So we had a little bit of lack of snow that winter for European skiing. And so, um, um, uh, wait, what's, uh, oh, Bogner, uh, Willie Bogner, we were, he was always searching for more snow, right? And we were kind of going up deeper into the Dolomites and what he wanted, um, because down low there was not much snow. So uh, um, at the end of shooting, a few, maybe like, I don't know, three or four days in a row. Um, and Wolfie would say, well, come on, you know, in his fine German, his fine accent. And I'd jump on Wolfgang's back and he would ski down through the grass because we lost the snow. So through the grass, he's skiing with me on his back down to the village. Oh, he was, he was a gem. Boy, what a wonderful man. Wow. You know, he's passed away. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. Uh, that's yeah. uh, that's something else I've learned today. Then I didn't know you could ski without snow. That's that's great. It's going straight <laughs> on the grass. Yeah, go. you know, the grass was all soggy, wet from the melted snow. So, in, in in the scenes, then when you're skiing alongside Roger, is was Roger actually doing some of the skiing? Because I know he can ski himself. Or was he on one of the sort of carts and you can just see the camera shot from his waist upwards? Or was it a bit of a bit of each? Um, R- Roger, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> um, Cubby, can you hear me? <laughs> um, I don't think Barbara Broccoli or Michael Wilson will be upset with me. But, yeah, it was too risky for Roger to ski, right? Yeah, sure. sure. It's another yeah, thing. You know, hundreds of people would be out of work, right? Um, so, so yeah, Roger. Uh, they did their very best to make it look like Roger was skiing all the time, and they did a good job. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so, obviously, aside from Cortini, you had a lot of scenes at Pinewood itself. Um, yes. There must have been so many sets that you filmed on. What, what are your memories of filming back in Pinewood? Because I'm sure that that must have been quite an interesting experience as well. Yes. Um, yeah. Filming there was, um, that place is so special and historic. And um, uh, when I was there for, for, for uh, watching the woods and um, Superman was being shot also, and so Chris Reeve and I we became pretty good friends. And, you know, I had kind of this uh, this blue screen thing in Watching the Woods where it looked like the monster was picking me up. And so, you know, I 
I had kind of the same situation. It was on the same stage as where he was working with the blue screen, making him look like he was flying, making it look like, you know, the monster was carrying me off. Um, So that was pretty cool to, to hang with Christopher Reeve. And and then next thing you know, uh, they decided to reshoot the ending of Watcher in the Woods. So when for your eyes only, when I was supposed to be there to start filming for that, I was called back two months earlier to be at Pinewood to reshoot the ending of Watchmen Woods. So um, it was, it was, it was pretty fun. You know, now to look back at that, I can't believe that I was hanging with Christopher Reed and Roger Moore. I mean, you know, at the time I thought, Oh yeah, just more, you know, other actors and Betty Davis and, Another day at work, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> oh, pretty pretty cool place, boy. The the names that have walked through that studio, though. Yeah, pretty I fantastic. Can, I can imagine. What, so, yeah. what was it like working alongside Sir Roger? Then was he was he the the kind of the prankster that we've we've heard stories about all those oh, all, all those years? What was it like? The, the height of it, just the <laughs> height of that that title. I mean. Sir Roger, the prankster. (laughs) He was a delight. He was so fun. He was so, so um, charismatic, of course, and genuine and it sounds weird. He's so alive, you know, but he was um, warm and you just wanted to give him a hug. I'd like to give him a hug right now. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't we all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he was he was terrific. He he was hysterical when uh, we were doing that scene where I'm in the bed. And now, when I think back, um, that must have been no no wonder he had to make fun of it all day long because his son was the same age as me. So. <laughs> To be doing that scene, you know, and my parents were there and, uh, you know, we just giggled all day long. And, of course, he had to just make all kinds of fun about it and say, well, you know, I would jump in, but your parents are right there. And uh, John Glenn would say, okay, Roger, that was funny, but can we're going to do one more, Roger. Can you just do the scripted line, please? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then he'd throw some other line in, and uh, you know there was always shenanigans. And once again, okay, Roger, can we just do one with the scripted line? <laughs> 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 so, okay, we'll make John Glenn and Michael Wilson happy. <laughs> Nicely done. So I think you were like twenty-two at the time. Is that right? Um, something. I think twenty-one. Twenty-one. I was Mentally, about fifteen. So. <laughs> Which suited the character, I guess. I mean, when I think twenty-two-year-olds now, when I see them, I was not that. <laughs> you went to visit Pinewood last year. In fact, I, I met you briefly at the Roger yes. Moore Memorial. How was that going back to Pinewood and everything? And, and oh, obviously, so with the special. memorial itself, it was so special. So my sister came with. Absolutely, mm. you know. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah. And we hung with Johnny Marino, which was a blast and a half. Oh, my gosh. And we saw John Wyman and um, all these people. It was so special. It was so fantastic. And, of course, to to be there on such a sad occasion. But it was was really, really cool to be with those people and celebrate Roger's life. And so following on from working with Roger, you also got to work with Julian Glover and also yes. Tuffpole. So what was it like yes. working with both of those? They, they must have been fun to work with. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I've done a lot of work here in the States, you know, but those are like, oh, my gosh, those are like actors, you know, real <laughs> actors. It was, it was a cool cast. So, would, would do you have any uh, memories of of Cubby Broccoli? Obviously, you were saying about your kind of audition chat kind of thing before you got oh, the role. Sure. But did he come to visit set much when you were shooting? Oh yes, he was there a lot. You know, and him and Roger playing uh, backgammon, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the the first AD going, okay, Roger, we're ready for you, and Roger, t- I gotta make this move, and him. <laughs> I'd be looking at the back end. 
you know, it was like, it was like, um, you, you would not think of it as wasting money because it, it kept this family of happiness and joy and, um, it, it, it was so special. It's different than any movie I've ever, drastically polar opposite than any movie I've been on to, to be with those people that have worked together so many times and they knew what it took to create a happy set. And if, if Roger was going to make a move, then, you know, we're waiting for Roger to see if he can beat Cubby. <laughs> You're going to be a brave person to interrupt Cubby or Roger during their battle. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the first AD was so delicate. <laughs> oh, for a brave man. Yeah. Um, I, I saw the same thing um, working with Betty Davis. And the first AD was so delicate. <laughs> okay, Miss Davis ready for you <laughs> yeah. and she would take her silver goblet think about it and then maybe walk over and put it down walk onto the set <laughs> <laughs> you know? that's how you do it <laughs> yeah you mentioned earlier about john glenn um now yes. obviously this was his first time he'd been on the bond films for, for many a year doing right. sort of sec second unit sort of stuff mainly and this was his first feature film as a director right. so what, what well, he was he also like edited. as a director didn't he edit the prior yes that's right yeah, yeah he was yeah. second yeah. unit director and editor and this right. was his first sort of main main sort of director uh, feature role right. so what was he like as a director to work with wonderful yeah mm. it was uh, the first time i'd worked with a director who had been an editor and hmm. it, you could you could see the diff the difference right off the bat i mean he knew how it was going to cut together and what he needed to make that puzzle put be, being, you know, just intricately put together. So he knew every angle. It, it, he was very efficient. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're working on, um, say we're working on a scene, right. And they're going to shoot your close up, Then they're going to shoot my close up. They're, they're going to do a two shot. Right. And then they might say, well, let's do one more over the shoulder this way. And then maybe let's do one shot. That, you know, it, you know, it can keep going. Right. And so each time you do a new camera angle on the slate, it's, you know, you start with a, and the next angle is B and it keeps going. Right. And usually well, like with John Glenn, who knew how it was going to be shot, how it was going to fit together, maybe three angles, you know, in a basic scene, right? So I had worked with a director prior. Um, we went through the alphabet. We went through the alphabet before he realized he had the shot, he had the scene. So, you know, John Glenn knew how it was going to go together. And everything was done efficiently. So maybe that's why, you know, they could take the time for Roger to finish the backgammon game. Because <laughs> <laughs> John Glenn was very efficient and, and a wonderful guy. So John had a son, has a son who was um, a few years younger than I. So, you know, it, it's, um, it was kind of, it was special, you know. He knew where my mind was, right? He was a dad, right? Mm -hmm. He knew what I was about, right? And Roger knew what I was about, so it was it was special. Roger, uh, as well as a prankster, a lot of people say he he's quite filthy with some of his jokes. Now, <laughs> as you were of such an innocent age, I, yes. I wonder if Roger was was still sort of open to some filthy jokes when you were around, or did he keep that for separate for a, a no, different time? I think there was <laughs> real. Roger, a little bit nasty, you know. I mentioned him. Michael Payne had a lot of wild jokes, right? <laughs> so I imagine Roger was just the same. However, because I was this, you know, strict athlete, two hours before school I was on the ice, four hours after school I was on the ice. So I grew up with blinders. So a lot of the filthiness I had no clue about. <laughs> and I remember there were times when my sister would be laughing and I would be going, huh? And I would just <laughs> about my day. 
<laughs> so I think I missed a lot of it. Um, and that's okay. You know, I, I still have the ultimate respect for Roger. I would love to be a fly on the wall and witness some of those jokes while you, uh, yeah. while you, while they were going over your head back in those days. <laughs> I think I'd be laughing hysterically. <laughs> cool stuff. So I know a, a lot of the, you know, you, you, you work on a, on a movie like a bond and you're busy for several months and stuff. And then, a whole nother section of work begins when it's time to like promote the film and traveling around doing press and all that kind of stuff. So do you have much memory of that kind of thing? Like going to the Royal premiere and all that kind of stuff. How was that for you? Oh my gosh, the Royal premiere. (gasps) I had no idea at the time how cool that was. It's, it's become more impactful ever since, you know, but to, you know, be told to go to Harrods to get white gloves because you cannot touch the royal skin, um, to, uh, you know, be instructed on how I'm going to meet the royalty, you know, what I have to say and do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That was outrageous, right? And, of course, you know, I'm standing between, I'm standing between Topol and um, John Glenn, and Cubby's over there, right? And the the royals, they start walking in, right? And I've been told, um, do not talk to them. You can only respond to what they say, right? right? And the first thing you have to do is curtsy, right? So um, uh, um, now I forgot, was it Princess Anne or Princess Margaret? Margaret. Anyway, I did that nicely, right? And... Um, then uh, Lady Diana comes along, and I was like, it was like two two girls, you know, just like, holy cow, this is crazy. <laughs> I can't believe this. You know, it was like our eyes met that way, saying, this is nutty. And so I kind of totally forgot the protocol, and Diana kind of grinned, and I kind of grinned, and I put my hand out, and I said, hi. <laughs> I forgot the curtsy. I forgot that I'm only supposed to respond to what she says, and then she started giggling, and I started laughing, and um, and then I had to pull myself together to to see to do it properly with Prince Charles. <laughs> so I curtsied, and I only responded to him, and that was pretty special. That's funny. Wow. I bet they they must be used to that over the years that, you know, when, when you're put in front of a face like Prince Charles or Princess Diana, you, your right. mind must just completely blank and you just don't even know right. what to so say you know, or do. At, yeah. Yeah, at the time, this was all fresh for her. Mm. I don't know if there was many premieres for her prior to For Your Eyes Only. It's, I think this was pretty new. I mean, she was Lady Diana. I think that might have been her first one, yeah. It could be her first one. <gasps> No wonder we looked at each other and just grinned. <laughs> ah, boy, we're talking about a lot of people who passed away. Yeah. Uh, wait, um, you know, Ursula Andress is right behind you. I know she is, and that's very well spotted. This is my little podcast room. I and, just uh, know yeah. that. That's maybe why I answered that question that way. <laughs> well, I, I, I really should have had a BB doll one put up behind for, exactly. for today. But, uh, Guys. Uh, Thinking. Uh, yeah, another time. You know, going back to favorite scene, um, the scene where um, Roger in the helicopter, um, the bad dude, was, the helicopter tips and he goes down into the chimney. Mm-hmm. That was pretty spectacular. I mean, all those stunts were uh, fantastic, you know. Um, Gosh. Yeah, that was a pretty cool moment. What's the start on stunt work? I mean, everybody's just followed everything that Bond has done, right? Did did that get a big cheer at the Royal premiere? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that and the end of For Your Eyes Only where the parrot is talking. (laughs) (laughs) And the prime minister. That was hysterical. Oh, Oh, my God. And, you know, I don't know if um, there was not nearly as much laughter in that scene in the States, but in in London, that was hysterical. I can imagine. Went, went down well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so f- um, just going on beyond For Your Eyes Only for a bit, Lynn, you, you obviously did a, a couple more movies and a few more uh, TV shows. Did you, yeah. did you want to sort of stay in acting sort of for the – 
you know, for the rest of your career, did you see that as your main thing or did you want to sort of step aside and, and with, for family and everything like that? Or how did, how did things work out? At the time I really thought, um, just pursuing this, you know, as a, as an ex competitor, athletic competitor, I was being a competitor in this business and I was pursuing it. But, um, I, I, um, I didn't really, I didn't really play the game how I was supposed to play the game. Mm-hmm. And um, it sort of failed me. Um, one reason was because um, I did not want to be in any movies where there are nude scenes. And, you know, in the 80s, 90s, all those movies were about, you know, young girls coming of age. And, mm-hmm. and I just told my agent manager, no, I don't really want to even go on those auditions and, you know, they were pretty angry with me and I was pretty happy with myself. And so that's kind of how it went, you know. But um, another uh, what I learned later as far as like playing the game, part of this business is um, you have to be out there. You know, at the beginning we talked about, you know, right place, right time and luck and everything. But really, you have to be out there to make it work for you. You have to ring people up. You have to go out at night and hang with this. You got to know these people. You got to be out there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I did not really know how to play the game. I was not interested in playing that game. And, and that's because of coming from being an athlete where you work hard and you show your stuff in front of the judges. And that's that as an athlete, it's no, you know, you don't, you don't ring up judges and say, Hey, how you doing? Want to get together? It's, you know, an athletic background is not that you train hard and you show your stuff. Well, applying that technique to the acting world, which is what I did, (laughs) does not fly. Um, so there were even, um, (laughs) when I, when I look back and I think, Oh my gosh, I was so silly. Um, I, as I said earlier, I had, um, meetings with, um, Dustin Hoffman. This is around the time of the movie Tootsie and we had great long chats An audition with Dustin Hoffman was, you know, a lunch and talking about this and that, not necessarily about the movie. It was a long chat. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, and he, um, I was in New York staying at the Plaza hotel and, and he rang me up and it was 10 o'clock at night and he rang me up and wanted to go out in the town with a couple other people. And I said, Dustin, it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm in bed, you know, like I'm 12. Right. So, you know, really, that's really not playing the game very well. <laughs> I should have gone out and played the game. Right. Doesn't mean I'm, you know, meeting with Harvey Weinstein. Right. But, um, you know, it's just, just different than being an athlete. And I, I did not do that so well. Um, kind of the same situation happened with Steven Spielberg and, um, (laughs) Steven and I, we had had a few meetings, auditions slash meetings. And, One time I ran into him at the airport and we were both wearing these hot cowboy hats. And he said, well, let's switch hats on our trip and come back and see me after your trip. And I said, "Okay." So we went to different gates and um, came home from the trip. And, you know, a few days go by and I'm thinking, oh, I guess I should get this hat back to Stephen not really thinking, holy cow, it's Steven Spielberg, you know, play this, play this right, you know. So I, uh, I went to his office and the secretary said, um, uh, Steven is um, busy right now. And I said, oh, OK, well, here's his cowboy hat. And I put the hat on the desk with the secretary and I said, just tell him thank you very much. And I left. I mean, holy cow. <laughs> I mean, by right, if I was, you know, my goal was to be in this business, I should have sat there twiddling thumbs for hours until he was available, right? But I was 
you know, I grew up in the Midwest. I, I'm not a pushy person. I'm, I do things nice and, you know, yeah. and so, okay, tell him thank you. And I walked out and I drove home and I thought I was such a nice girl. I'm sure Stephen will think I was a really nice girl, yeah. right? Yeah. Did, oh. did he, th- did he um, thank you for it in the end? No, never oh. heard from him again. Oh. Because, you know, in this business, you, you've got to push the door open, right? Yeah. Being an athlete, you don't don't push a door open. An athlete, you work hard. When the meet comes, the competition comes, you show your stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's no pushing a door open. So anyway, but the bottom line is I kind of uh, it, it worked my way out of the business and I started thinking, you know, a great husband and a great family is a better goal right now. And that's kind of where I am. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be where I am. I had a great life in the business and having a great family life. So it's all okay. That's a, that's a beautiful thing because you never know, you know, everybody who goes into that business has these dreams of huge stardom and stuff. And you never know whether that's the right thing for you because there is a thing exactly. of being too famous and successful, isn't there? You know, when you, when you get past a certain level where does it really bring you happiness? You look at somebody like Michael Jackson, for example, who had oh, the yeah. heights, heights of everything, but it was like, was really right. happy at the end of the day, you know? And, and right. so sometimes that, you know, if it, if it doesn't go in that direction, that can actually be a good thing. And it sounds like that's the way it went for right. you. You know, that direction or the other direction where you end up struggling and being a waitress, mm. just waiting and waiting for Stephen to call you. <laughs> Is yeah. that what you want? You know? So I think it worked ev- out at the end. Yeah, <laughs> everything happens for a reason as well. And you obviously made the choice and, you know, and 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 it, it was better for you, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. and it's been great. So, uh, yeah, no, it's brilliant. There is one thing I'd like to just uh, have a, a chat with you about, which was yeah. it was back in January 2010, I think, you were on a yeah. flight somewhere and you suffered a stroke. Now, yeah. this wasn't any sort of normal stroke. This was quite a hard-hitting one and you ended up having to have heart surgery and everything like this. So, I mean, it must have had such a sort of, uh, the experience must have sort of really hit you and, and, and did it change your outlook in any way? And, and oh, yeah. yeah. And, and can you tell us if you don't mind, can yeah. you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, that was, um, um, it, you know, being an athlete to, um, of course at the time when you're having a stroke, you have no clue up from down. Right. But when I look back on it, Um, all the times that something like this could have happened, you know, um, you know, being in altitude skiing or, you know, I, I was a competitive uh, sailor. Um, the, the stroke happened because of this hole in my heart that we did not know about. Um, so I was lucky to be with my family when it happened, but, um, extraordinary lucky, to be able to recover from it. So um, three clots went into the middle cerebral artery right here. And um, they say something like four out of 10 people die with a clot in the middle cerebral artery, but it's like um, branches here. So two of the clots moved out. Um, And I had no clue up from down in the hospital for about three days. Uh, my husband was there in the hospital and they said, who is this? And I, and we'd already been married 20 years, 18 years. And I said, um, he's a boyfriend. I had no clue. <laughs> wow. I thought it was 1964. Um, I, for probably six months afterwards, I could not, um, could not spell my name. I did not know my phone number. I could not tell you my birthday address, any of that stuff. So the stroke affected my memory. I was in cognitive therapy for a year afterwards to um, get this brain working again. And I was incredibly lucky to pull through this. Wow. Um, and then I had the heart surgery to repair the little hole. And the crazy thing about it, this hole, it's called a PFO. And when you are born, the reason that first breath 
or when, you know, in movies when the doctor slaps the babies behind, right? <laughs> that hole is, um, as a fetus, that's so that the fetus can breathe through the mother, right? Mm-hmm. So that first breath of flap is supposed to shut, right? So in about, uh, um, I don't know, 25% of the population, the flap does not shut. Most people, it's not a problem at all. Um, for some people, um, something like a stroke can happen. So um, I was uh, extremely lucky and extremely lucky when and where it happened. Um, and uh, oh, just so grateful. So I, I did um, a lot of help with American Heart Association for a few years afterwards to try to explain to people you need to um, you need to find out if you have this hole in your heart because a lot of people have it and um, the when people think of uh, having a stroke they think oh you know it's from alcohol or drugs or being overweight or whatever not necessarily or for being old not necessarily and it's a little bit hereditary and so my father had it, um, my brother had it, and my brother had two strokes mm. and um, has lost his peripheral vision from the last stroke. His stroke went to that part of the brain, the visual part. Mine was just some memory. We're lucky to be walking and talking. Absolutely. So that's yeah. an amazing story. It was brutal, but... All of that, it, it was like, <clears throat> once again, being an athlete, just fighting through it and, you know, spelling words and um, c- coming up with answers. Where do you live? And hope I never have to go through it again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's good to see you back firing on all cylinders right now. That's for sure. Definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm about... Uh, I'm about eight out of ten cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, and clearly you had the strength to carry on the the determination. So your you like you mentioned with your ice skating and your sort of competitive edge or your drive, that clearly right. must have helped you to 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 get back to where you are today. So that's fa- fantastic. Yes, that's what they said. That I just I fought like bloody hell through this, you know, <laughs> through the tears and the aggravation and. But, um, boy, life is good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. So uh, just uh, out of interest, when was the last time you actually watched um, For Your Eyes Only? And what do your kids uh, think of seeing mum on the screen? Um, oh, is it, hey, yeah. it's a ball. Just, yeah, yeah it's, it's so fun. But, you know, um, <laughs> the, my kids are uh, uh, 18 and 20. So they, you know, and people say my daughter looks just like me. So it's really fun for them. They are that age that I was. Wow. And, yeah. and did, did Kellen or Gen Z have any aspirations to be actors or not? No. Um, or ice yeah, skaters? No, we, did, we did a few plays together oh, nice. and um, they had fun doing that. But they're, they were much more sports minded. Um, my son was pretty hot in track through high school and, um, my daughter is a, um, competitive gymnast at college. So, um, you know, they put their time and energy into sports yeah. and that seems safer to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, a lot of ups and downs in the business and I'm pretty happy not to be living in LA and, um, it, it, the business is, it, it's extraordinary, but it's an extraordinary long shot. Um, so I saw wonderful actors that never got a job. I mean, it's, it's pretty tough. Yeah. And so um, what, what's your opinion of the fact that James Bond is still going strong to this day and obviously being a part of that and that phenomenon, does it, I mean, does that surprise you? And, and, and what, what's your sort of thoughts about that? No, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, it, as I said before, it's, it's a huge part of film history of, of, of talkies. This is so many years 
of this wonderful character. I mean, Ian Fleming, it's, it's unbelievable. But what the Broccoli's have done with this, it's extraordinary. Nothing is, is ever going to come close to the duration and success that they have had. No, no, sure, for yeah. sure, definitely. Um, have you seen any of the recent Bond films as well, that, like the Daniel Craig yeah. tenure? And and are you yeah. a fan of those? Yeah. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. And and Michael Wilson, um, we flew to Mexico together for the premiere, and uh, he was so funny about talking about Daniel Craig. I mean, well, you know, Michael is terrific, anyways, but. You know, they have their hands full with all these wonderful actors. You know, Michael had his hands full with Roger and he's got his hands full with Daniel. And, and you know, at that point when we were flying together and he was talking about whether Daniel's doing another one or not, he was just like, you know, all right, he's going to do it. <laughs> just, um, he's got his hands full, but they, they, um, they are holding tight to this wonderful character and doing great things and entertaining the world. It's pretty amazing. Absolutely. Sure. I, I remember the stories of Sir Roger would, would drive a hard bargain with, with them securing him for his next film. And it was one film at a time for years and years and years until he finally yeah. left. So I imagine yeah. that, yeah, they had their hands full with him. I'm sure they still do with Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Definitely. Wait. Can you see this right there, my skates? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> so they are sitting right there to encourage me to to get going a little more often. <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's mentally hard to go skating because you want to do stuff and the body does not listen <laughs> really well. And, uh, but, you know, they're, they're sitting there and... Uh, <laughs> I go, I go uh, frequently. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Sweet. Here we are. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Lynn. It's been an absolute pleasure and a delight. Thank you so much for your time. Thank it you, guys. Yeah, it really has, Lynn. And uh, it'll be <laughs> lovely if we get a chance to bump into you again at some point, hopefully. Um, we might catch you in a, in a skating rink if we're ever across the pond. <laughs> there you go, yes. <laughs> you can give us some I'd tips. I'd rather come across the pond, as you know, you Brits say, if I would go over to London, I'd rather go across that pond. <laughs> okay, that's, that's fine with us. We'll work it out. Sounds good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks again, Lynn, and take care. Take care, guys. Cool. Yes. See you soon. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. Well, what a wonderful interview that was, man. She really warmed my heart there. It was, it was so lovely. It's kind of, you know, having like a really real discussion like that as well, like those stories about, you know, crossing paths with Steven Spielberg and like that whole story with the hat and how she's like crazy, kicking herself now it? looking back yeah. on that. It's it's just so lovely to have those those kind of honest conversations and stuff and like the thought of you know her family taking priority over all that kind of stuff. It's 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 really lovely to have a conversation like that because oftentimes when you interview you know celebrities and actors and stuff throughout the ages, you do get that sanitized media version. Do you know what I mean? Where it's all the mm. stories that you know you're supposed to hear that they can quote easily and all that kind of stuff. Whereas that really felt like a real conversation from start to finish, and it was. I really enjoyed that one. I did. And also I thought it was really refreshing to hear kind of how innocent in her way she was in Mm -hmm. terms of, you know, how, what was she in her twenties, but she was acting like a 16 year old, but in terms of the ways of many uh, sort of uh, kids that age, she was a bit innocent and that's kind of nice. And I think that obviously added to the character as well, I think. Um, But also, uh, you know, that went for an incredibly incredibly tough time with with obviously um the operation and everything like that that she that she talked about and um you know to to pull through and come through the other side that shows how much of a sort of trooper she is you know mm. how how much of a strong character she has so yeah. it was really i felt you know that was really you know that got me that did when she when she sort of started uh speaking about a stroke and everything um yeah. but i mean just an absolute darling, such yeah. a lovely, lovely person. And just a sort of, again, you know, we always talk about certain um, actors maybe who we'd like to go out for a drink with, mm. but with Lynn Holly, I'd love to just 
go out for like an afternoon tea with her. Like go go to Stoke Poges and, <laughs> yeah. and have little cakes or something and, and have a and have a nice little sort of chin wag over a cup of tea or something. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. she seems so nice. You could easy, you could chat to her like all yeah. all day. Couldn't Sometimes you? you get you you get just that vibe that somebody's just is a good person. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. instantly take you know you instantly like them, you instantly get on, they're super easy to talk to, super down to earth. You know, it's uh it's just, which is a rarity, sadly, in the in the whole uh, show business world, isn't it? But yeah, it's, uh, it, it was is. it was lovely to have have Lynn on the show. The the one uh, unfortunate thing was I had a slight technical glitch during the early part of the interview, so I might have uh, sort of slipped away and ca- and came back again yeah. shortly after. You got a little bit too shy. You're like, I can't believe I'm talking <laughs> to Phoebe. I'm, I can't That's handle it. it. Yeah. And you had to hang this up and a, have a breather. You know, yeah, lie down for a minute it, and then come it, back. In, inverted commas, technical glitch, but everything was sorted <laughs> afterwards. I felt I felt. My much better than I. I felt stronger. I could come absolutely. back. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed that. Really, really top notch interview. Absolutely. Thanks. Big thanks to Lynn for taking the time to do that for us. Definitely. She's made. Thank you, Lynn. I know us two Bond geeks very happy, but I'm sure a lot of JBR listeners very happy too. Definitely. So, shall we uh, revisit our trivia question of the day? Our listener trivia question. Yep. And this one was from Mr. Rory Simpson. Here we go. How many actors and actresses who have appeared in Bond films have won acting Oscars? Okay. How many yes. actors or actresses who've appeared in Bond films have won right, let's go through Oscars them. there? Yeah. Christopher so Walken. So it's acting also. Yeah, Christopher Walken, definitely, obviously. Um, well, Sean Connery. Uh, yeah. un- the Untouchables. Mm, so, I mean, that's go. got to be in there. Um, your favourite actress of all time? Who's that? Have a guess. It's not Madonna, but it's close. Who's my favourite actress of all time? If it's not Madonna. <laughs> I don't know. Who is it? Ha- Halle Berry. Oh, she, God. You, when, when she won the role, she had just won her Oscar for uh, Monst- Monsters Mon- or something. Mon- Monster or something. Mon- Monster, what was that called? Was. Monsters that Ball. Monsters, Monsters Ball. Ball, yes. Yeah. Do you remember um, when she was crying? Yeah, yeah no, I, did, yeah. Do, I, do you know what? Three. I don't have any disdain for Halle Berry. No, I, 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 I have, I have, I, I do like Halle Berry. It's just, you know, unfortunate that, that Die Another Day happened. But um, yeah, no, I, I've got no problems with Halle, God bless no. her. I think, uh, yeah. you know, if it's Madonna, I've got some serious issues as we, as we <laughs> talked about before. I mean, we could do a whole podcast on my Madonna issues, but uh, let's, right. let's save okay. that for another time. Let's leave that for now. Um, who else have we got? Um, right, who's oh, uh, obviously Javier Bardem, uh, No Country for Old Men, lovely. Um, uh, Judy Dench, I'm sure she got one, didn't she, she? must I, have if she hasn't, yeah, it's Judy a bloody Dench, crime. She, no, she would have done. Um, Rafe, no, I don't think Rafe Fiennes has now. That's someone who should have done because he should have got one for Schindler's List, mm. but I, I know who was nominated, but I don't think he got one for Schindler's List. If he hasn't got one, that's mad because he should have one, uh, like. Well, he just should do, shouldn't he? Because he's brilliant. Um, who else have we got? Oh, uh, oh, obviously, Benicio del Toro. Um, he he won one. Um, Very nice. How many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Who else is there? Uh, so who have we said? Oh, I can think of one more. Go on. Re- incredibly recent Bond film. Christoph. Yes. Ah, in- nice. Glor- Inglorious um, Bastards, and maybe um, what was the other one? Tarantino one. Uh, Django. I think he might have won for both. Uh, he definitely okay. got it for Inglorious anyway. So yeah. Very so, nice. Your your um, Oscar knowledge is way deeper yeah. than mine. So I, 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 do, even, I, do, I stopped yeah. after Christopher Walken. I'd even forgot Connery had one. Yeah. <laughs> Connery, oh, no. <laughs> I, yeah, Untouchables. I think, I can't think of any others. Yeah, I thought Ray Fiennes, but I don't think he has. Um, All right, should Robert we turn Short, to yeah. Rory and find out? Yeah, the answer? Let's do it. Yeah. Hi, Tristan Thomas, Roy from the UK, with the answer to the trivia question I set. I probably should have said that they were official Bond films. I haven't included Casino Royale, the original, and Never Say Never Again. But anyway, seven I can think of are uh, Christopher Walken, Lisa Del Toro, Judy Dench, Halle Berry, Javier Bardem, Christoph Waltz, and of course, Sean Connery. Hope you all got that. Probably did. Not too difficult question, I thought anyway. Um, thank you very much for all the podcasts. They're all fantastic. And speak soon. Bye-bye. Oh, there you go. That was a nice one, wasn't it? That was a nice one. You you, you yeah. nailed the donkey on the head there, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. I still think Rafe needs one. Uh, like, he, he's quality actor. I'm sure he will get one at some point if, yeah. if the right movie comes up. Because he did the old English, what was it? The English? English Patient. 
Yeah, and yeah. and um and obviously Schindler's List. Yeah, I remember, I remember my uh, being from the Isle of Wight originally. That's where Anthony Minghella, the the director of the English oh, yeah. Patient, was from. And there oh, is a right. there's a brand of ice cream local to the Isle of Wight called Minghella's, which is the Minghella family. And I remember when the English Patient was all the rage back in the day. I remember being at my high school, and. Every assembly, my head teacher was just banging on about Anthony Minghella and the and the English patient, really? and it, it was just like he was like a local hero, and oh, okay. uh, and yeah, and little did I know at the time that that film was going to star a future M. Yeah, there we and go. Yeah. yeah, if someone had told your little self, then <laughs> it would have been like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll watch absolutely. it. Um, cool, great, great question though. Really good mm. question. Nice one, Rory. Um, so next up we have the guess, guess the, the quote, quote round. Bum, 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 James, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. Is he falling off the chair? There he is. Oh, I'm back again. I'm back again. <laughs> oh, man, oh, we have a lot funny. of fun with that one. Don't uh, we? I know. I like it. I like it. Okay, so hit me with it. You. It was your quote last time, I think. Uh, was it? Oh, yeah. It was my yes. quote last time, wasn't it? Oh shit. Yeah. yeah. All right. My quote was. Oh, what was What's the matter? Oh man. Can you do it again, please? <clears throat> What's the matter? Is ah, uh, is it is it a female? It certainly is. Is she foreign? She certainly is. Is she a Bond girl? She certainly is. Is she in one of the Daniel Craig films? No, she's not. Oh, can you do it one more time? Sorry. What's the matter? Oh, I'll, I, if I gave you a hint, yeah. Our man in Somerset, Dan Gale, would be a fan. Oh, oh, um, that's not Linda, is it? Is nope. it Linda? Nope. No, it's not Linda. No, what's the matter? What's the matter? Oh, mate, I think you got me with it. Damn it. Okay, oh, if I give you the following line, Chris. Okay. If you perform what I just performed, and then I'll give you the following okay. line and you'll kick yourself. Okay. Wait, oh, 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 okay, now I haven't got enough time. Okay, what's the matter? Bad accident back there. Oh! <laughs> no! Damn it! Damn it! Damn it. That's a Isn't good it one. Yeah. That's one of those things, man. When you know you when you get it afterwards, and you're like, yeah. "Fuck, I knew that." You know what I mean? Yeah. It just all slots that, into place. That was a tough one, though. She yeah. hasn't got a, a name, has she? Like the uh, the character? Or it's Cara, it? oh, yeah, isn't it? It's Cara. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, mate. Oh, that was a tough one. That was good. That was a good one, though. That was a good one. It cool. Was. Cool. Okay. So you have a quote for us this time, I hope. Yes. Now, rather than your usual one or two words, I've gone for a bit of a sentence here, and I think you'll get it. And I'm right. going to apologise in advance for the accent. Okay. okay. <clears throat> My quote for this week is, "And now, ladies and gentlemen, it- oh no." <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what is absolutely amazing? I already know what that is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was abysmal. That was abysmal. Right, okay, here we go. I'm going to do it properly now, okay? <clears throat> I can't do it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you look to your left as we go down the Amstel, you can see... Oh... <laughs> mate God. that was a beauty i already i already knew what that was that was with the first aborted version that was great man yeah that was okay, lovely there we go so hopefully some of the listeners might have an idea about yeah, that one absolutely. for next week ah uh, okay so there we go we have a listener um quote for this week and uh, actually we got last week's one to listen we to first haven't we yeah. from mr jared alberich should Let's we have, have a listen it. to that one again Let's Hey guys, once again, this is Jared Albrecht, the yard sale artist from On Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. Since I had you on the line, I figured I'd do a listener quote for you. So what do you have on this? I can't breathe. Okay, so I will give you the film. Yes, I will give you the scene and you can give me the name. Obviously, Gold and I. I will go for the scene upon the Manticore Yacht. And his name is Admiral. Oh. Uh, uh, hold on, Admiral. Ch- 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 
Ah, uh, give me more of the word. Ch- Chuck is his first name. Admiral, Admiral Chuck. Chuck Farrell. Yes. Oh. Is it Farrell? Yes, it is no, Farrell. It is Farrell. Yes. Yeah. All right, nice. Nice one, Admiral right. Chuck Farrell. Superb. Yeah. Good stuff. Great. So let's uh, turn it over to Jared. Make sure we got it right. I'm sure we have. Yeah. But let's, I'm uh, sure, well, yeah. let's have a listen. Hello again, guys. This is Jared Albrecht, the yard sale artist from On Her Majesty's Secret Podcast, calling back with the answer to my listener quote, which has to be by far the very best dying words a man has ever said that was Admiral Farrell as he was being squeezed to death by the lovely Zenya Zagevna on a top in Goldeneye. Hope you guys got it. Love your show. Catch you next time. Beautiful. Nice. There we go. We pinned yeah, the sail on the donkey on. right there, didn't we? Beautiful stuff. Cheers, Jared. Cheers, Jared. Great quote there. And for this week's new listener quote we have is from Mr. Keith Atherton. Should we have a listen to Keith's quote? Let's do it. Hi, guys. This is Keith Atherton calling from Station E in Edinburgh. A long-time listener, first-time caller. So I've got a listener quote for you today. The quote is, did I? <laughs> Again, that is... Did I? So best of luck with the quote, guys. Uh, I'm sure it's pretty straightforward for you. Um, speak to you soon. Cheers. That was nice. a beauty. I don't that think was... a, there is a JBR listener in the land who didn't instantly raise a no. smile as soon as they heard that one. And I know there's a particular group of people who are listening who may have performed that very line in that very location only last year. Um, so, yes, I know that everyone there will certainly be getting that for sure. Um, yeah, stuff. A brilliant, brilliant delivery as well, as Absolutely. they all are. They always Beautiful are. Beautiful stuff. Nice one, Keith. First time caller, he said there. So welcome yeah. aboard the good ship, JBR. We will be setting sail very soon. All right, <laughs> <Lovely>. cool. <laughs> A float at sea. (laughs) Indeed, adrift. Okay, next up, Chris. I'm sure you're very excited because it is time for... Who got the soul for living and dying? Who played Helga Branta now did she die? That's right. It's time for Tommy Trivia. This is where Chris breaks out a card from the 007 Trivial Pursuit deck and quizzes me on the questions. Now, I've been doing pretty well for the last couple of weeks. I've been getting yes. a lot of these questions right. I, th- I, think, I think the last two weeks in a row, I've got all six out of six, haven't I? Well, I think one, you got six, you got seven out of six because you got a, a bonus point for knowing a die another day question, yeah. didn't yeah, you? Yeah, oh, that's yeah, true. Yeah. So, yeah, nice. Yeah, excellent stuff. Okay, so this week, Tommy, we're going to start with crew and behind the scenes. Are you Lovely. ready? I am. Question one. The novel From Russia With Love was on the f- list of the top 10 favourite books of JFK. which US president? <laughs> <laughs> it is JFK. Of course it is. Brilliant nice. stuff. On to question two. Casting characters. Who plays Le Chiffre? Who plays that, Le Chiffre? Well, it depends whether you're talking about 67 Casino Royale or 2006, but I'm guessing they're thinking Mads Mikkelsen. Uh, no, sixty-seven. No, yes, they are. Of course, nice. they are. Can you do you know who plays Le Chiffre in sixty-seven Casino Royale? That's awesome, Wells, isn't it? Do you know who plays Le Chiffre in fifty-four Casino Royale? That is Peter Lorre. Oh, Tommy! He's only oh, done it, hasn't he? My God, you've never made me more proud, my friend. <laughs> that is absolutely brilliant. Okay, we're going to go on to the films. Which character does Topol play? Colombo. Yes, indeed. Do you not know the first one, name? Not the one who, uh, <laughs> you know, does Choose one more thing as he, yeah, <laughs> yeah. as he leaves. What's his first name? Uh, yes. Columbo. Uh, oh, shit. Hold on. Um, Begins with, I'll give you the first letter if you want. Yeah, give me the first letter. Uh, M. Oh, shit. M-I. <laughs> Michael <laughs> Milos Milos Of course Milos it's Milos, Milos. There yeah. we go. But you still You still get the points That's Thanks, cool man. Okay On to the vehicles What type of vehicle Is in the San Monique transport That Bond commandeers In his escape from uh, With Solitaire From Dr. Kananga That would be A double decker bus it certainly would. Absolutely. See, brilliant. I can handle okay. vehicle questions like that. Yeah, it's like that, brand that, names of yeah. cars is where I struggle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We've got two more to go. Um, this question is gadgets and weapons. What does Bond read while using the safe cracker at Gunbolt's office? 
It's funny. I, would you call a Playboy magazine a gadget or a weapon? I don't know, but I suppose well, you could roll yeah. it up and twat somebody with it, can you? <laughs> That's true. And would you be reading or just staring? <laughs> I guess. I mean, you know, there's 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 a deep question. There's there's quite a few options with that, really. But uh, yeah, yes. you, you'd be able. To, yeah, I'd read the articles, Chris. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, of, of course, yeah. That's yeah. that's all you need it for. Excellent stuff. Okay, so you were one question away, Tom, from a clean sweep for the third or fourth week in a row. Okay, so question number six this week is on locations okay can you please tell me in what city was the world premiere of a view to a kill that would be san francisco yes oh he's done it ladies and gentlemen he has gone and thank done you it. thank you thank you very much brilliant brilliant yep. stuff tommy um yeah flabbergasted mate Beautiful. I love the sh- Le Chiffres. You got all three. I was so happy. What can that. I tell you? That's what good. can I tell you, man? <laughs> all right. Cool. Good stuff. Cool. So it is time, Chris, to tackle the final game of the day, which, of course, is... Is the music you? That's right. It's time for Guess the Music Cue. This is where Chris furnishes us with a little tiny snippet of Bond score music. We have to guess the name of the film and the scene it's from. So Indeed. what, what yes. I suppose we have to revisit last week's question, don't we? We certainly do. Cue. Now, this one, I yeah, this one I think I might have flummoxed you a little bit, but let's have mm. a listen and see what everyone thinks. Let's do it. Okay. Mm. So... Is it a view to a kill? I would say no, but I would say you're in the right ballpark of actor. I know I'm going to get this. Hold on. If you kept repeating that, that's kind of what happens in that scene. (laughs) Uh, Hold on. Shit. See, I was thinking that would have... You've got the right composer and you've got the right actor for Bond, if that helps. Yeah. that takes out a couple. So, we, it, well, three even. I mean, have I got the right sort of period as well? So, would it be octopus if it's not a view to a kill? I, I would say you're looking a little bit earlier than that. Quite oh, a bit earlier than that. All right. Yeah. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Man with the golden gun. Oh, yes. It's Man with the golden gun, it. isn't it? Yes. Yes. That then is uh, end of the film. Solex agitator. He's trying to get it out. Good night's wonderful posterior pushing the button. Big problems. Absolutely spot nice. on, my friend. Yeah. Yes, there it is. There I don't know is. why that made me think of View to a Kill. I wonder if there's a there's a a, a, a cue on a View to a Kill that sounds something like that. Because maybe, maybe in my is, mind yeah. that was like the bit where the dude gets minced in the impeller. Okay, and that yeah, sort yeah. Of se- that sort of sequence. But yeah, now I know it. Clear as day. Yeah, now you got gun it. Yeah. It. yeah, brilliant stuff. Superb. There we are. Okay, so All we right. have a new music cue for this week. Um, let's have a listen. Let's do it. Mm. All right. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. a tricky one, that one. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. not immediately jumping out at me. Yeah. No. So we've got right. a little bit of a Bond theme in there, which is quite cool. We do, um, don't we? Yeah. There All we right. go. Got a week to think about it. A week to think about it, indeed. All right. Good stuff. That brings us to the conclusion of today's edition of James Bond Radio. Yeah. So uh, I think we should probably, uh, I mean, Dude, we've 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 kicked out two. The last two Belter episodes, episodes have been immense, haven't they? Yeah. yeah, I mean, two absolutely amazing interviews. Big shout out to Richard, and big shout out, obviously, to Lynn today. Um, just you know, made us. I mean, I went to bed smiling that night, and I'm mm. sure you did as well. Yeah, absolutely. And what an absolute lovely, lovely person she was as yeah, well, absolutely. and really nice to interview as well. Yeah. So yeah, superb today. Absolutely. So James Bond yes. Radio will return next week as usual, and we'll we'll probably stay a little bit tight lipped on what we're going to be talking about. Or yeah. are we gonna are we gonna drop a hint? I, I think we could drop a hint potentially during the week, unless you want to throw out a little curveball. Now it's up to you. What do you think? I say we keep an eye if on something, things. Something glints, and yeah, I, I reckon we could keep an eye on anything that glints, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll see that how was, we get on. That, okay, that sounds good to me. All right, cool. Okay, cool. We'll do All that. right, mate. Well, I'll see you next week. I will see you next week, <laughs> and we'll see everyone else <laughs> next week too. <laughs> I've been Tom Sears. I have been Chris Wright. And James Bond Radio will return next Friday as per usual. We'll see you then, everybody. Bye. See you then. Ciao.